Jeremiah chapter 3, we'll get there in just a moment, and I want to talk to you this morning about the difference between uh, the interpretation and application of Scripture. Yesterday, we considered the doctrinal interpretation of Hebrews, and we saw that it is not written to the body of Christ in the age of grace, it's written to, go figure now, the Hebrews, just like the title. And there are no Hebrews in the body of Christ. Whether Jew or Gentile, in this age, when you believe the gospel, the grace of God, you're baptized by one spirit and one body, which the Bible clearly says is neither Jew nor Gentile. And so the fact that Hebrews is written to the Hebrews ought to tell you something, right? And um, so it's not written to us, it's not written about us, but that does not mean we cannot get a blessing from it. We certainly should. And we're going to see that this morning as we consider the difference between interpretation and application. And by the end of the lesson, I'm going to show you some things in Hebrews that we can certainly apply. The fact is, all Scripture is profitable, Genesis to Revelation. And so when we rightly divide the word of truth, we're not trying to get rid of any of it. We're just trying to understand it. And God is the one who told us to rightly divide his word. God put divisions in his word that we must see and maintain in our study if we're going to understand his word. Um, but it seems like it's one extreme or the other. you got some churches, all they want to do is make application. They never teach doctrine and interpretation. And then, if you're not careful, you can go to the other extreme, and all you want to do is Bible study and doctrine, but you never apply anything. Both are necessary. Both have their place. There's a difference, but we need both. We need interpretation and application. Um, to the dollar store and get a but you can get a Bible they're they're available and we have the Word of God in our country and there's churches everywhere but churches are becoming more and more like uh, entertainment centers and and it's all about the performance in the show and uh, the socializing and there's a great neglect of the Word of God we have the Word of God in America uh, but sadly and really let's be honest that's the root problem in our country right now. It's not so much a Republican versus Democrat thing or a black versus white thing. It's, it's light and darkness. It's God versus Satan. And people just, we have so many people in our country that just don't fear the Lord. They don't know who he is because they're ignorant of the word of God. The best thing we can do for our country is preach the gospel and teach the Bible and make the ministry all about the word of God because that's what it is about. And... So a big reason for people being so ignorant of the Word of God is they, they have only heard in their churches secondary applications of a scripture, but very few are being taught how to study the Bible for themselves and understand the Bible in context with the right doctrinal interpretation. Now, God gave us His Word and he told us how to study it. 2 Timothy 2.15, we'll talk more about that in the next service. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. God told us how to study his word. He gave It's his word. He's the one who tells us how to study it. If we're going to understand it, we've got to study it his way. And people need to be shown the right way. But then they need to take it upon themselves in their daily walk to study the word of God personally. Now, as a pastor, and I know Drew agrees with me on this, and he does the, he believes the same thing, and, and this is the goal. It is our goal to not only teach and preach the Word of God, but also to help you learn how to study it for yourself. Okay, um, you can you can feed a man fish and feed him one day, but if you teach him how to fish, you can feed him for the rest of his life. You understand? And so, look in Jeremiah chapter 3. Now, here's an example of application. An application. Jeremiah 3.15 is not about this present age. It's a prophecy concerning Israel and what God's going to give them in the future. They, they had leaders in their nation that failed miserably by not being faithful to the word of God. But God's promising that he's going to give them pastors according to his heart. And this is an important verse because it, it really shows you the primary responsibility of a pastor. Now understand, 
there are pastors in this age, and being a pastor, there's a principle to it. There are Israel had pastors. We have pastors. It's a um, there's differences in what we're teaching and so forth, but the basic role, the basic function, the basic responsibility is clear. Look at Jeremiah three fifteen. I'll give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. God's people need to be fed God's word. The job of the pastor is to show God's people the knowledge of God and the understanding of his word. It's not the job of the pastor to keep everybody entertained, tell a bunch of stupid jokes, and do all the kind of stuff you see going on. Uh, the, the sad truth is a lot of time in churches today a pastor will get up and read a verse and then he launches out in the wild blue yonder and talks about things that got nothing to do with what he read. The Bible said preach the word. That doesn't mean preach what you think about the word. Preach the word itself in context, rightly divided. That's why, you know, you got to have an emphasis on verse-by-verse verse preaching because it keeps you in context. And, and it's about knowledge and understanding. Now, not just mental, uh, spiritual knowledge, spiritual understanding. Bible study is not supposed to be about just gaining knowledge. It's about the knowledge of God. It's about knowing Him. In fact, here in Jeremiah, look in um, chapter 9. So that statement in Jeremiah 3.15 certainly applies in this age as well. That basic function and responsibility of a pastor. Jeremiah 9, verse 23. Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. All that fades away. And is nothing in comparison to the Lord. But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me. And Paul said, if you're going to glory, he said, glory in the Lord. So here's a principle again that we can apply. What we ought to glory in is, is this, that he understandeth and knoweth me. Well, Jeremiah 3.15. God said, I want pastors to feed my people with knowledge and understanding. About the stock market? <laughs> about politics? No, about God. Knowledge and understanding of God. Most important thing is to know the Lord in a real relationship. And you can only know Him through His Word because that's where He's revealed Himself. He didn't reveal Himself in your feelings and circumstances. He revealed Himself in His Word. So there must be an emphasis on the Word of God, teaching and preaching the Word of God. And we glory in the Lord as we know him and understand the things of God. And then the verse goes on that I am the Lord, which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Now, it is the goal in ministry to see babes in Christ grow into spiritual maturity. And that comes by a personal knowledge and understanding of the Lord and his word. I won't turn over there, but Ephesians 4, uh, Paul talks about the work of the ministry, and the edifying of the body of Christ, and he talks about pastors and teachers, and it's the same concept. And uh, In fact, in Hebrews, it talks about the milk of the word and how you need to go on to the meat of the word. Paul says the same thing in 1 Corinthians 3. The mark of a carnal believer is they can only handle the milk. They never get into the meat. Now, milk is great, and that's where you start, but that's not where you stop. You need to grow so that you can handle the meat of the word. But look, let's be honest, the average church today, you start giving the meat of the word, most people just choke. They can't take it. And then they turn around and call it heresy. It's heresy to them because they, they don't get it because they're ignorant of the word of God. And they're comparing the, the teaching to their traditions instead of comparing it to the scripture to see whether it's so. You need to be like a Berean in Acts 17. They search the scriptures daily to see whether it was so. Paul said, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Everything you're hearing, take it to the word of God and prove it by the word of God. Now, hearing the Bible preached a few times a week is not sufficient. 
for your spiritual growth. Thank God that uh, we can have church and meet together, and that, that'll help us. But I'm saying we got to have a daily diet of the Word of God. Too many Christians base what they believe on what they hear in sermons and songs. And by the way, don't base your theology on songs. Some of the worst theology you ever hear is in Christian gospel music. I mean, I've been to the river, been baptized, washed in the blood of the land. They're comparing getting washed from your sins with getting baptized, which is wrong. <laughs> and some of the songs that we're familiar with, when you really analyze them, man. <laughs> so but you, you get it from the Word of God, and you got to learn to personally study the Bible on your own. The Bible's the authority, the, the Word of God. Um, if what you're hearing doesn't line up with what the Word of God says, then just forget it. Throw it out. It's not right. But if it does line up, then hold to it. It's the truth. Uh, you grow much more when you personally get in the Word of God and let it get in you. You have to digest the Word of God to get the benefits out of it. Look in Jeremiah 15. You see, if you just hear it, that's not enough. you got to believe it with all your heart, and the Word of God has to be in you in order to change you. Thy word have I hid in mine heart, not my head. Starts with hearing it and understanding it up here, but you've got to believe it with all your heart. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee, Psalm 119 says. The Bible says, Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 2, that God's word worketh effectually in them that believe see inwardly I, I fear there's a lot of people that it goes in one ear and out the other and they never they never digest the word of god they never assimilate it into their system and really the bible's likened to food and the way you digest the word of god is you meditate on it you read it then you study it which is carefully examining it to understand it and then as you get the truth, you meditate on it and give yourself wholly to it. As Paul said in 1 Timothy 4, that's meditation. I mean, really getting it in you. And then when it's there, Paul said in 1 Timothy 4, when you're nourished up in the word of faith and good doctrine, then you can exercise yourself to godliness. Look in Jeremiah 15, 16. Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart, for I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. That's a good principle. Once again, that's an application. And we can take that and apply it. Um, the word of God, we need to eat it in that we, we get it in our system. It becomes a part of who we are. You can't be healthy. And I, and I don't want to be gross, but I have to say it feeding on regurgitated food. Someone else studies. They get it in their system, and you're getting it secondhand. Now, it can help you to hear someone teach and preach, but you've got to feed on the Word of God personally. That's the key. And there's nothing, hey, when you begin to understand the Word of God, you're talking about joy. Now, people don't read the Bible because they don't understand what they're reading. But when you begin to understand it, you want more and more, right? Because there's nothing better than learning about who the Lord is and his plan and purpose for the ages. Now, uh, I don't think, well, I know most pastors would not admit this, but there are many out there that really don't want their people to study the Bible. I've heard a few actually go that far and say, you just listen to me. And they'll get up and preach say, close your Bible. You look at me, I'm talking. What, 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 they don't want people checking them up, right? And the reason why some preachers don't want people to study the Bible is they want the people to see them as their authority. But even Paul the Apostle, who saw the Lord and wrote half the New Testament, said in 2 Corinthians 1.24, Not that we have dominion over your faith, we're helpers of your joy, by faith you stand. He said, all we're trying to do is... <laughs> This microphone's driving me crazy. How do you deal with this thing? <laughs> it's all right. Um, 
He said, you know, we don't have dominion over you. We're trying to help your joy. You stand by faith personally. Beware of any preachers trying to have dominion over you. We're supposed to just show you the word of God, encourage you to study it for yourself. But if the preacher wants to be the authority, he don't want people studying the Bible because they'll find out a lot of stuff he's saying just ain't so. They don't want people to realize how much they're abusing the word of God. Paul said we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. 2 Corinthians 4, 2. He said, uh, or excuse me, 2 Corinthians 2, 17. He said there are many corrupting the word of God. And in 2 Corinthians 4, 2, he said there are those who handle it deceitfully. They'll take a verse out of context and do their own thing with it. That's dishonest. That's the way the devil handles the Bible. Check out how Satan is with the Bible in Genesis 3 and Matthew 4. What does he do? He questions it. He tampers with it. He changes it. And he puts his own spin on it. And that's exactly what many pastors are doing. Sadly. I'm not trying to be mean and negative. I'm just telling you like it is. I mean, I'm just pointing it out. It's obvious. And, and the reason is, it's a lot easier to keep a baby Christian under bondage. When people are growing spiritually and they know the truth, they're not as uh, likely to, to come under the bondage of a tyrannical pastor. <laughs> you understand? Now again, people don't study the Bible because they don't enjoy it, and they don't enjoy it because they don't understand it, and they don't understand it because they don't know how to study it. But I'm telling you this morning that spiritual understanding of the Word of God is very essential. Let me show you something in Colossians chapter 1. And I'm going to get to some things. Of, I'm just trying to lay a little foundation here. Colossians chapter 1. Spiritual understanding of the Word of God is essential to a fruitful Christian walk. Colossians 1.9 For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, not cease to pray for you, desire you might be filled with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That. All right, here's the result. Where are you going to get the knowledge of His will Wisdom and spiritual understanding. You get it from the Word of God. The Spirit of God through the Word of God. Now, what's the result? That you might walk worthy of the Lord and all pleasing. Now, there's a lot of preachers getting up demanding everybody live right, but they're not teaching them how. They're not teaching them how to live the Christian life. They're not teaching them the doctrine. You can't beat people over the head and get results that are going to last. People have to be built up in the faith. He said, that you might walk worthy of the Lord and all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power and all patience and longsuffering with joyfulness and so on. But that increasing in the knowledge of God. You know, the sad reality is a lot of, a lot of uh, churches, you know, the 5% of the Bible is preached 95% of the time. And, and there are people who, they have God in their little box, and they think they got it all figured out because they know a few things about the Bible, and they quit growing. But Paul, toward the end of his ministry, who literally was caught up to the third heaven, who literally saw the Lord, who literally wrote Scripture by inspiration of God, Paul said in Philippians 3, that I may know him. He wanted to keep increasing in the knowledge of God. Now, God wants us to understand the scriptures. That's why he gave us the book. Jesus Christ, in Luke 24, it says, Then open he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Now, the Bible is a spiritual book. So you, I don't care how smart you are or how smart you think you are. <laughs> uh, you can't understand the word of God without believing it and the Holy Spirit enlightening you. That's why there's country preachers out there that that you know barely ma made it through school and yet they are far more knowledgeable of the word of god than some of these big wig theologians sitting dried up behind a desk at a cemetery called seminaries they don't even believe see a lot of these scholars don't even believe the bible and it's a closed book 
a close but well, quit be, we don't need to be impressed just because somebody has more degrees than a thermometer it ain't worth the paper it's written on if you don't understand the word of God I mean doctor this and doctor that give me a break you know this stuff gets, and, and it's about, it's like those Pharisees, you know. They love the uppermost seats in the synagogues. They love the titles. They love the, the accolades, you know. We're supposed to be pointing people to God, not ourselves. And by the way, you want to know who the Lord was the most harsh toward? It was those religious leaders that were puffed up with pride, and they were hypocrites. And they loved tradition more than the Word of God. No, we need God to open our understanding. So we need to believe the Bible, study it God's way. And when it comes to studying the Bible God's way, one of the things is you've got to know the difference between interpretation and application. Let's, let's go ahead and look in Luke 24. I want to show you something there. Luke chapter 24. Uh, while you're finding that, is there coffee on the premises? <laughs> All right, I just, afterward, I'd like to guzzle some of that. I, that coffee at the hotel is a poor excuse for, it's a nice hotel. N coffee's, look, if you ought to, coffee ought to be so dark and so thick, you can almost get it and eat it with a spoon. You know, a lot of the, these hotel coffees, man, it's like, it looks like tea. You know, it's not coffee. <laughs> I got a headache because I don't have a real caffeine amount in my system at this point. <laughs> Luke, Luke chapter 24, notice, and, and I'm, I don't have time to read the whole passage here, but the two on the road to Emmaus, I'm sure you're familiar after the resurrection of Christ, what's going on here. But Luke 24, verse 27, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he, the Lord Jesus, expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And by the way, if you love God, you're going to love the Word of God. Because the Word of God is all, I don't need it right now, I hope you're not going to, I can wait. <laughs> I can wait till afterward. I was just putting that out there. You know. <laughs> Thank you, though. But uh, the Word of God's all about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the Word of God. He's the Word of God incarnate. The Bible is the, Word, is the inspired Word of God. You can't know the Father but through the Son, but you can't know the Son but through the Scriptures. That's where He's revealed. And he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And so the more we love the Lord, the more we're going to love his word because that's where we know him and where he's revealed. Look at verse 40, uh, 32. And they said one to another, did not our heart burn within us? That's why I said last night after those hickory fries. <laughs> They said one to another, did not our heart burn within us? And they were good, by the way. And thank God I didn't get sick. It all settled well. And I'm glad I made that choice. <laughs> A little heartburn is worth it as far as I'm concerned, you know. Did not our heart burn within us when he taught with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? Now notice, he expounded. And in expounding, what did he do? He opened. In other words, the interpretation has got to do with the proper explanation and the unfolding and opening of the text like God gave it. God wrote the book the way he did for a reason. We need to understand it first and foremost in its context, what God says plainly. There's a great chapter in uh, Nehemiah 8. You don't have to turn there unless you want. I'm going to try to do this quickly, but it's a great chapter on revival and the people were revived because they got back to the Word of God. But it talked, there's an emphasis in that chapter on understanding what's written. But when the leaders got up to read the law, it said in Nehemiah 8, verse 8, So they read in the book, in the law of God distinctly, and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. Okay? And so you got a pastor like that. I've heard him teach, does a great job. He gets up, reads the passage, and explains it to you. Don't take that for granted, because I'm here to tell you, a lot of pastors have gotten away from that. They're storytellers now. They're philosophers. And I know I'm being kind of negative, but I'm just pointing out the reality. I didn't make the reality. I'm just pointing it out. I wish 
It's my desire that all churches believe the Bible and preach the truth. I'm not, we're not any better. We only know what we know by the grace of God. But it's just the days we live in, and the Bible said it would be that way. The Bible told us how it would be in the last days. And it said many would not endure sound doctrine, and they would turn away their ears from the truth and be turned unto fables. And that's what's going on. Now, Miles Coverdale, who um, was an, he, he did an early, very early translation of the English Bible. In fact, he was born in 1488. Coverdale, in the front of his translation, said this. Listen, it shall greatly help ye to understand Scripture if thou mark not only what is spoken or written, but of whom and to whom, with what words, at what time, where to, what intent, with what circumstances, considering what goeth before and what followeth after. All that means is study it in context. The simple fact is much of the Bible is not written directly to us or about us in this age of grace. That's the simple truth. But it's all for us. 2 Timothy 3.16, it's profitable. It's for us. It's not all to us. It's not all about us, but it's all for us. And so Paul showed us how to make proper application. Let me give you an example. Romans 15. Romans chapter 15. I, I, you know, really the whole first half of this chapter is along these lines of what I'm talking about, but I'm not going to, for time's sake, read all of that. Because um, what you find Paul doing in this chapter is making an application of Old Testament Scripture. And he even talks about the earthly ministry of Christ as our example. Now listen, we know, I'm sure you know this, I'm sure your pastor's t shown you this in the Word of God, Jesus Christ said, I'm not sent but the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I mean, that's a simple fact. In his, and it wasn't that he didn't care about the Gentiles, but according to prophecy, Israel had to be saved and blessed first, and then they'd be a light to the nations. But his earthly ministry was to Israel. But don't go to the extreme to think you can't get a blessing out of things he said and did. Because Paul quotes Christ a number of times in his epistles. I mean, I, I, I have a message where I show that. I mean, Paul several times makes application from the earthly ministry of Christ. And you see it right here in Romans 15, verse 1. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak, not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself. But, and talking about the greatest servant who ever walked the face of this earth is God Almighty. Can you imagine that? God Almighty taking on flesh. What humility. Can you imagine God Almighty being born as a baby? He was. The Son of God took on flesh. And when He came, He came not to be served. He came to serve. And He's our example in that. And Paul uses that in Philippians 2, doesn't he? Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Talking about His humility. He said, but as it is written, the reproaches that reproach, uh, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. For what sort of things were written aforetime, written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. These things are written for our learning. The things written aforetime in the Old Testament. Again, in 1 Corinthians 10, Paul uses Israel in the wilderness to teach us some things. Okay? So, here's the deal about this. Uh, I'm going to quote now from... A Bullinger, I don't agree with Bullinger on everything, that's for sure. But he, you know, I've read a lot of his material. He had some good teaching. But he said in 1907, he said, The interpretation of a passage belongs to the occasion when and the persons to whom or of whom the words were originally intended. When that has been settled, then it's open for us to make application of those words to ourselves or others so far as we can do so without coming into conflict with any other passage. And what he said is, seek first and foremost to know the interpretation. Once that's settled, you can apply it as long as you don't contradict sound doctrine in doing so. But the common practice today, again, is to spiritualize the Bible. That's not very spiritual. <laughs> 
Those who, t- those who spiritualize the Bible don't have spiritual eyes, and so they wind up telling spiritual lies. <laughs> when they spiritualize the Bible, they read it, and then they say, now this is what it means, I'm a, and this is my slant on it. And what they're telling you it means is not what it says. I heard a Church of Christ preacher try to talk about the book of Revelation. They believe everything in the book of Revelation was fulfilled in the first century. Which means they don't believe the Bible. <laughs> okay? Because there ain't no way that was fulfilled in the first century. It's, it's a prophecy yet to be fulfilled. But he said, and I quote, When you read the book of Revelation, you read it and you say, Now that's what it says. But then you got to ask, what does it really mean? Because it does not mean what it says. You know, another word for that is garbage. <laughs> okay? That is so wrong. That's, God means what he says and says what he means. Okay? Now, it's been, said, it's been said that you can just about teach anything out of the Bible when you take it out of context and, and, and misapply it. I remember a preacher on TV years ago. It caught my attention because he kept repeating the same verse from Ecclesiastes. He said, money answereth all things. And he just, boy, he was on that money. Money, 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 money. Give me your money. I want your money. Money answereth all things. (laughs) It actually says that. Of course, what he was doing with it was totally wrong, okay? Yep. Solomon also said, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Solomon had more money than anybody and said, I hated life because he turned from God. You know, it's a lot easier to uh, tell stories than it is to preach the word of God. It's a labor. The Bible said, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. 1 Timothy 5, 17. All right, it's a labor, and that's why... That's why, sadly, a lot of guys, they just go online, find an outline, and then they go play golf, and that's it. But if you're going to study the Bible and teach the Bible, it's a labor. I know sometimes, oh, preachers get up and talk a couple times a week, and that's all, you know. Well, some do, but some of us work at what we do. And it is, spiritual labor is, is labor. And I, I, I've done, I mean, I've, I've worked with a roofing crew in the summertime, uh, when I was real young, and that, that's kind of hard stuff, to, you know, that's labor. But I tell you what, I get more wore out spiritually studying the Bible and trying to do the work of the ministry. It's still labor, but that's what we need. And, and uh, so praise the Lord you have a pastor here that's doing that. Now, let me give you these here real quick, and I'm going to show you before we do. I'm not going to have much time. I'm just going to show you a couple verses in Hebrews that we can apply just to balance out what we've done this weekend. But... I should have given these notes, and, and I can send this to the pastor, and, and if he wants to print them out and give them to you next week, we can talk about that. But let me quickly give you a couple points on the difference between interpretation and application. It, it's very simple. First of all, the interpretation is doctrinal. The application is practical. So first, learn the truth. That's doctrine. Doctrine is teaching. you got to first learn the truth before you can live the truth. Interpretation is about learning the truth. Application is about living the truth. Now, number two, every passage of Scripture has one right interpretation. There are not many interpretations. You ever heard that? Oh, there's many interpretations. What it means to you may not be what it means to me, but I really could care less what it means to you or me or anybody else. What I want to know is what does it mean when God wrote it, right? There's only one right interpretation. Now, there's various applications. You get that? One right interpretation, various applications. Number three, it is not our place to interpret the Bible. The Bible said no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. You don't get to interpret it. That's not your job. God interprets it when you study it His way. The Bible interprets itself. It's a self-interpreting book. When you study the Bible in context, compare Scripture with Scripture, and rightly divide the word of truth, it'll be an open book to you. And the Bible even defines its own words. You can learn how to use the built-in dictionary of the Word of God. By the way, it only works in the King James Bible. The new Bibles, 
they, they fail miserably in this because they're changing the Word of God. But when you study the pure Word of God, you'll find it defines its own words. Number four, the Bible is to always be taken in the normal and literal sense unless it's clearly using symbolic or figurative language. Okay? Most of the Bible is written in literal, plain language. Now, there are symbols. There are figures. There are, I mean, Paul said in Galatians, he said there's an allegory. Well, you know then, it's an allegory. It still has literal teaching and meaning, but he's using an allegory. Uh, when Jesus said, I am the door, he obviously didn't mean he was a piece of wood with hinges on it. Okay? It's a figure. It's a, there's metaphors. There, but the Bible, when it uses that, you'll know it. And it interprets it for you. Okay? Uh, number five, we need to first seek to understand the doctrine and the interpretation before we make any application. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for, number one, doctrine. Reproof, correction, instruction. Number one, God gave the Bible, number one, for doctrine. So before you start making your application, you've got to have a doctrinal foundation. When you study Paul's epistles, he always begins with doctrine, then makes the application. Ephesians has six chapters. The first three are doctrine. The last three are application of the doctrine. Okay? The first three chapters, who we are in the body of Christ. The last three, how to live that out by faith. If you don't understand doctrine first, you're going to wind up making some of the wrong applications. Number six, we must always... Let me rephrase that. <laughs> we must not <laughs> make any application that violates interpretation. You understand? Don't violate the doctrine with your application. Now, in this age, it's very simple. Paul said, consider what I say, and the Lord give the understanding in all things. You want to know why most people understand the Bible? Because they ignore Paul. Paul's epistles are the most neglected part of the Bible in the average church. Because it's doctrine, and people want to go into the Old Testament and pull those stories, and then they take, and they're real stories, and they're literal, but they take it and they make it mean something other than what it's meaning and saying. No, you could, Paul writes to us today. He tells us that by inspiration, very plainly. Follow me as I follow Christ. I speak to you Gentiles. Listen to me, listen to me. I mean, he's clear. All right, so we're living in the age of grace. Paul was given that information to give to us. So when I'm reading outside of Paul's epistles, if what I'm reading lines up with what Paul said, I apply it. If it doesn't, I rightly divide it. Moses said, don't eat shrimp. Well, I got news for you. I eat shrimp. Why? Paul said I could. <laughs> I'm not under the dietary law in the age of grace. You see that? You can't, people say, I just believe the whole Bible, fought. well, I believe the whole Bible too, but I'm not going to be a hypocrite and claim I follow the whole Bible. Nobody does. It's impossible to follow all the instructions when they're different. Right? People say, well, bless God, I take the red letters and I follow Jesus. I can prove to you in five seconds that you don't. Okay? <laughs> There's a lot of things he said ain't nobody doing today. Now, there are things he said that do apply. Absolutely. But to say you're just going to, and, and listen, Jesus Christ is the one who sent Paul and gave him the words to give to us. All right, now, uh, lastly, it is a major hindrance in your study to take the application and pretend it's the interpretation. And that's what you have in the average church. People only know an application, and they never learn the interpretation. Now, we got a couple minutes, you said 945, 1045? Look in uh, Hebrews 4 real quick. I'm gonna, and you can take Hebrews and go through this and see for yourself. But let me give you a couple examples. I meant to reserve more time for this, I, but I, I'm poor at time management. That's, that's just sad, isn't it? <laughs> you think after preaching 20 years you'd learn how to use the clock, and I don't. Sometimes I'll be preaching 30 minutes and I'm in my introduction. And I say, all right, long introduction, short message. <laughs> Hebrews 4.12. In fact, let's, let's do this. Let me show you this. Verse 11. Let us labor, therefore, to enter in that rest. And that rest is the kingdom age. Lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. 
That's Doctrinally speaking, that's not to us in this age. We don't labor to enter rest. We have rest in Christ the moment we simply believe. But look at verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It's a living book, the word of God. Verse 12, that applies, doesn't it? That's true. Paul said, take the word of God, which is the sword of the spirit. Actually, he said, take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I told you, I'm dyslexic. <laughs> I mentioned that yesterday. I get things backwards all the time. So, you know what? Verse 12 is a great application, isn't it? And you can go through Hebrews. At the end of chapter 5, he talks about the milk and the meat of the Word. Go to 1 Corinthians 3, Paul does the same thing. Look at Hebrews 11, we'll finish there. Hebrews 11. Verse 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Now, that, this is the faith chapter. The whole chapter is on faith. It's a tremendous blessing. You ought to study it and make many applications. You can look at Abel, his example of worship. Enoch and his example of his walk. Noah and his example of his work. Abraham and his example of waiting. You can go through here and I'm telling you what, you can get a great blessing. I'm telling you, and I marked it down, I've got a list in front of me. I've got something in every chapter of Hebrews that applies today. Every chapter. But you know what, if you don't understand what we talked about yesterday... In rightly dividing the book of Hebrews, you're going to get yourself in some big trouble. Hebrews 6, 4 to 6 doesn't apply today. It's not to us. Now, there are things in Hebrews that are for us. Because look, the moral principles of God never change. There are things in the Bible that never change. Dispensational truth is God progressively revealing more and more and making some changes in his dealings with man. You got to note that. Look, there's a unity to the Bible. Everybody knows that. 66 books, but it's one. The problem is people ignore the divisions of the Bible, and that's what gets you in trouble. Interpretation and application. The interpretation of Hebrews, it's not to us. The application, there are things in it for us. Father, thank you for the Word of God. Help